Good evening. It is seven o'clock, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you for joining us in this second edition of Happiness Reboot, a series that Vani and I have started uh, primarily to explore stories and themes that impact happiness and the workplace. So here we are distilling lessons on life and happiness for workplaces for people who uh, are working somewhere and that includes homemakers. So we are not leaving out homemakers, we believe that homemakers are the original working professionals. Vani and I, for those of you who don't know us, are the happiness wallas. Our life's purpose is inspiring happiness. We have an interesting story, I'll keep it short quickly tell you why we do what we do. So for the last 12 years, Vani and I have been living through, going through a crippling bankruptcy. It's been a, a numbing phase of our life. In this time, materially, we've been dealing with darkness. When you have, for long spells of time, no work and no money, you obviously begin to imagine that your world has come to an end. We went through that phase. But simultaneously, a process of internal inquiry happened. And that led us to understand that no matter what, life can and must be faced. We discovered and taught ourselves the art of being non-worrying, non-frustrated, and non-suffering. And we found out that it was possible to be happy despite our circumstances. That's when we examined what we were doing more closely. We were struggling and we still are struggling to put our business back on track, to earn money and retire our debt. In fact, in the last 12 years, we've not even really paid a rupee in our debt. And we are struggling to even cover living expenses so success has been very, very elusive in our life. But we asked ourselves, even if we can't be successful, how can we be useful? And that led me to write my book, Fall Like a Rose Petal, which launched in 2014, where I share lessons, spiritual lessons that we learned going through this phase of our life. The Tamil edition of the book, Udhiru Nojaidar Kolet, launched uh, a few weeks back, right here at the same venue. And we found that through the launch of my book, a completely new opportunity spectrum opened up for us to share our learnings with a larger audience. We retooled our business and we now are a workplace happiness firm, AV Initiatives, where we distill life lessons. We explore human stories and we distill lessons on life, happiness and leadership for managers. We also, uh, over this time, opened up our hearts and decided to meet more and more people. And we run four conversation series across Chennai. Uh, bliss Catchers, Happiness Conversations, Uncommon Leader, and this one, Happiness Reboot. Each series is supported by a venue partner, and all these series are non-commercial, we don't make money from them, and are free to public. Why do we do this? We do this because it is our life's purpose to inspire happiness. We want to be out there reminding people that it is one life and it has to be lived meaningfully by being happy despite your circumstances. This is our story and today we are here with the second edition of Happiness Reboot. Happiness Reboot was started uh, in October this year with the idea of uh, helping people who are working all the time to pause and reflect on life and to understand why it is important 
to live a meaningful life, which is we all spend a lot of time at work, and that includes homemakers, I repeat again. And we think that happiness is outside of that sphere of work. And therefore, we unwittingly end up postponing happiness. So here is an invitation to happiness reboot, to anybody who wants to pause and reflect, that please reboot your life to what matters most, which is happiness. The format for this series, and this, 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 this is part I'm making this announcement, particularly for the benefit of our uh, old timers, members of the audience who keep coming regularly to our programs, the format of this series is different. Here, in the, there are three segments to each edition of the series. The first segment deals with exploration of the theme. Today's theme is Me Time, which, uh, which is what you would have received on your invitations. Uh, and then the second segment is a conversation with a wonderful uh, guest. This time's guest is Nandini Nair, the very young and happening IRS officer and a wonderful artist and dancer as well. So I'll be in conversation with Nandini in a bit. And the third segment involves you people, where you can be in conversation and discussion with us. Now, in an effort to make that third part very, very meaningful and productive, we have uh, taken up to using a tool called Mentimeter. So, uh, I would like all of you to get familiar with that tool. So, you, you cannot shoot answer questions to us directly, you can use the tool and send us your questions. Don't wait till the end of the conversation for you to ask your questions. As and when questions occur to you, send us the questions. Let me walk you through a very simple process here, which is go on your phones, on your browser to www.menti.com and please enter a passcode. Uh, there is a little box there. And if you uh, look up the box, you will find uh, a few digits there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now replace those digits with today's passcode, which is 214951. 214951. When you press send, when you press the blue button there, it will take you to uh, the next window where you can shoot your questions. The way to shoot your questions is to please put the, so please don't take voice calls in this room. Please step out, take the voice call and come back. Please put your name and address your question to one of us, to me, to Vani, to Nandini, whoever. Okay? I'll repeat these instructions again, but it's menti.com and 214951 is the passport for today. <coughs> your name and your question. So keep uh, keep sending in the questions. Vani will pick up at, at the end of the conversation I have with Nandini. She will pick up the uh, top three or five questions depending on how much time we have and we will be answering those questions for you today. For those of you who are reticent to use technology and who do insist on a live audience with either me or Vani or with Nandini, we will the three of us will be around for a little while after we close at 8.30 and you may still talk to us one-on-one, uh, -on -one, okay? But for the rest of you, menti.com. So that's the format of the conversation, that's how you can engage with us. And so let me now um, dive deep into the theme for the day, Men, uh, which is me time. So this morning I woke up and I was thinking about today's session. And a brilliant song written by Kannadasan, uh, <coughs> sung by T.M. Sundaraj, T.M. Sundaraj. Vishwanathan Ramamurthy is saying, Yenge Nimbadi, Yenge Nimbadi, Ange Enakore, Yedam Vendu. That song came to my mind. This is a song from Kudiya Parvai, a 1964 film produced by Sivaji himself. Amazing song, and I'm sure all of us at some time have craved for that inner peace. We feel like we are running on a treadmill, we feel that 
uh, we don't know whether we are coming or going and we uh, are constantly searching for a quiet place for ourselves. I have been there, I have felt that way. And I have seen the cathartic impact of postponing me time. And I have felt the pain of not living intelligently. Let me share a small incident from my life. On, um, I think it was 11th of September, another 9-11, 11th of September 2008, we dropped our son Ashipa at the Chennai International Airport. He was leaving for Chicago to study economics at the University of Chicago. He was 18 and he was setting off on his big adventure in his life. You may wonder, how, you know, how is it that a bankrupt family can support a child in the University of Chicago? Because I just told you that we are going through a bankruptcy. That's the miraculous story of our life. That's what is there. That story is there in the book, following like Rose Petal. But that's another story. We came back from the airport. Vani and Anshul, our daughter, went to sleep. And I was not up to sleeping. I was feeling very really lost in my life. Our son had just uh, been seen off on this, on this big adventure of his. Uh, it's a big feeling for a parent to see a child go into the big, vast world. And so I poured myself a glass of whiskey and I sat down. I tried switching channels on TV, nothing really interested me. So Yadur or Parvay P. Tirupi Patan on the uh, ledge in the living room was a picture of Ashika. And I went up to him to the picture and I looked at the picture and I started crying. And I asked the picture, now, I didn't see you grow up so fast. It was catharsis. And I can recall that moment so vividly because all through our uh, raising our children, all through that time, which was about the first two decades of our professional life also, my time was entirely invested in growing my career in managing a business that we later set up. That's the business that went bankrupt. And so I missed all, almost all PTA meetings. I missed almost all annual days. I missed almost all sports days. And I was never available as a parent for my children. I decided that night that I would correct the story for my daughter who was only 13 at that time. And till today, I have done a lot in terms of being available for my daughter, but I still can't go back and fix the time when our son was grown up. And I could not go back. I can't go back and undo any of those things, which is why I say it has been an extremely cathartic phase uh, for, for me to even acknowledge the fact that I was not available for our child. But my transformation did not happen that night. Three and a half years before that, before that moment, three and a half years before that, when our daughter was about nine, on her birthday, I sat in front of my diabetologist, the venerable Dr. C. V. Krishnaswamy. And he looked at all the uh, diagnostic reports in front of him. My sugar count was at 300. My uh, cholesterol was spiked. There was a spike in my cholesterol. I was hardly 36 at that time and I had a tobacco habit, I was drinking every day, though it wasn't a habit at least I told myself that I am not an alcoholic, but I had a tobacco habit and my doctor nodded his head looking at the reports and he said, young people like you, Davis, young people like you need to be a lot more serious about your health than anybody else. So why don't you take charge of your health, young man, and why don't you transform yourself? And he said, if you go this way, you will not see 40. It was a wake-up call. I was weighing 95 kilos that day. And I walked out of the doctor's clinic. I had so much of 
uh, Kutka in my car, stock of Manichan Kutka. I told you I had a tobacco habit. I took all of them to the nearest trash bin, an onyx bin, and I trashed it on Kasturi Nagar Road. And I resolved to change my life. I didn't know where to start. On one side, our business was totten. It hadn't reached levels of bankruptcy that would follow, but it was totten. On the other side, my health was not feeling good. I wasn't feeling good about myself. And I was craving, I was having this feeling of, can we put mobile phones in silent please? Please, please do text, please do take pictures. But, and please keep sending us your questions, but mobile phones in silent please. So, I was uh, dealing with this yenge nimadi, yenge nimadi kind of feeling within me. I tried meditation. I went to a lot of uh, people asking them to teach me meditation. But almost every form of meditation that I was initiated into told me, choose a quiet place. <coughs> so I found quiet places in temples sometimes, sometimes in parks, on the beach. But this guy here was never quiet. This guy was not quietening down. The environment was quiet, but within me there was chaos. Within me there was complete confusion. And that is when I stumbled upon. They say when the student is ready, the teacher shall appear. So I stumbled upon a quotation by Swami Vivekananda. And the quotation said, it, it, it spoke to me. It said, anyone can be calm when in a cave or when asleep. But stand in the midst of the battle of life. Stand in the madness of action, in the whirl of the madness of action, and find your center. When you find your center, you will be unmoved. And I asked myself, I remember coming back home and asking Vadi, Mom, how does one find one's center? I've tried meditation, I've tried, you know, taking care of my health, I've stopped my tobacco habit. We started a gym regimen at that time. So things were beginning to be done. But this guy, it wasn't happening. And that's when <clears throat> I stumbled upon another discovery. And that discovery is a practice. Now this is what worked for me. And you, you may take away what applies to you. Uh, and you may leave the rest. You may Google for more information. You will find some of it on my blog. You can talk to me about <coughs> it. But I'm just giving you an overview of the process that happened with me and how useful it was. So, um, I stumbled upon this discovery, which is of a practice called Shubha Mauna Yoga, where you observe silence for one hour daily. You observe the silence, not the environment. You become physically silent. And this is based on a simple principle, the principle of onion. I know onion prices are right now very high. So metaphorically, it's fine if you think of an onion right now. Don't, don't think about the pricing of onions. So it is based on the principle of peeling an onion. When you keep on peeling an onion layer after layer after layer, what are you finally left with? Nothing. That state of nothingness or shunya, nothingness is what you will reach when you learn to train your mind to peel off every sound that it is hearing. So when you sit quietly and you start concentrating on something, okay, on, on just peeling off sounds, if you are quiet in this room, you can hear my voice. And if you start telling your mind, shut up, Avis, shut up, Avis, you will go away from what I am saying. Although you will be hearing me, your mind will go away from me. And we have all done that very well in college. When the professor has been teaching something, and we have all switched off and thought of things that were more interesting for us. It's the same principle. So, you start by peeling off the layers of sounds that are distracting you. Then you start working on the thoughts that are coming in and intervening and distracting you. 
and you say go away and it will go away. That's the beauty of the mind. The mind is like the human body. You go to a gym to train the body. This is where you train your mind. So you peel away the sounds, the physical sounds. You peel away the thoughts. The human being, the human mind thinks 60,000 thoughts in a day. Most of these thoughts are of negative emotions. Anger, grief, guilt, worry, insecurity, fear. Most of these thoughts are of that nature. You keep peeling away those thoughts and you will come to a state where you will not have any feeling of thinking anything. You will be thinking. You will know that you are alive. You will know you are breathing. But these thoughts will not come. Now typically, it takes 21 days to make any habit. If you fall asleep trying to do this practice, if you get distracted by a phone call or a WhatsApp message beeping on your phone or your child coming and knocking on the door or your colleague if you are doing it at your workplace coming and interrupting your thoughts, you start all over again. So if your practice is broken even for one day, you start the 21 day cycle all over again. It took me 96 days to complete <coughs> my first cycle of 21 days of one hour of silence every day. This practice then gets taken to the next level. At the end of 21 days, you have learned to be silent, which is you have learned to still your mind. Then starts the practice of deploying the stillness, putting your mind to work. And through some inspirations, through some reading, through some native thinking, um, I created this process. Vani helped me a lot uh, through this journey and held my hand, uh, supported me at every step of the way. And so I can claim that we both have done this together, where <coughs> you employ your stillness. You're now able to drop anchor and go into silence. The moment you don't, it doesn't take one hour for you to go to that state of nothingness. It happens dramatically fast within 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Then you start employing your silence and you do that by dividing your hour into five blocks. The first 10 minutes you look at what happened in the last 24 hours. I used to have serious anger issues. I used to have serious guilt issues. And I would reflect on the futility of expressing anger in that manner, expressing guilt in that manner. You take that <coughs> 10 minutes to reflect on the futility of some of the choices you made. Don't beat yourself up, but you reflect on them. Then you set goals for the next, for today, set goals for tomorrow, set goals for the short term, mid term and long term. I religiously wrote down everything. Again and again and again. So what would happen when you do it again and again and again is it would get written in your mind. Then you don't need to write a journal anymore. It would, it would be there on top of your mind. Every single day you can recall your short term, mid term and long term goals. Particularly what you are going to do in the next 12 months and in the next 5 years. So you are replacing all your scarcity thoughts, all your negative thoughts with thoughts of constructive views of your life. What are you likely to achieve in the next 12 months and 5 years? And you could change it to 20 years, you could change it to 6 months. It's you, you play around with it the way you want to do it. But it's extremely beautiful when you reach that state. That state then gets to the next stage. So you first still your mind, then you deploy the stillness. The third is you go into immersion. I started my career as a writer, as a journalist. And then I got sucked into life. And I told Barton <coughs> once that I will never write again in my life. Writing is a waste of time. So can you imagine a, a guy who loves writing taking a decision never to write again and then the business goes into a crisis. I go into Mauna. Mauna helps me understand who I am. It helps me 
relate to life better and I discover, rediscover my ability to write again and I end up writing a blog which I continued for 10 years on the trot without missing a single day. That's how my book got done. And I wrote letters to my two children during the course of this bankruptcy that became my book. That phase continues even today though I took a gap year in 2018 when I didn't write every day. But now I'm back at it. I now write uh, short blog posts every day where I share learnings from life. Then I write my longer blog posts. Uh, you may find all my blogs over the last 10 years on WordPress. And it, it is very, very, very therapeutic for me. It's a very immersive experience. So you still your mind, you deploy that stillness, and you embrace an immersive experience. An immersive experience for me is writing. For money, it is cooking, it is music, it is gardening. For both of us, our immersive experiences are when we are together, when we are exploring human stories and we are telling stories to people about how we have learned lessons on life and happiness. So, in a way, me time, jumping off the treadmill, coming out of the chaos of life, me time helped me find myself in a way. Without this me time, I cannot even be sitting in front of you now and telling you the story of how we, in, in, you know, as we explored last time, famed entrepreneurs have become the happiness of us today. It helped us find our life's purpose or it turned us in the direction of life's purpose and life's purpose found us. And that happened because of reflection. When you pause and reflect, you learn to deal with life's issues better. You become resilient. You become stronger. When you are stronger, you stop asking the why, why me question. You become resourceful. You get down to work on what can you do with what you have. You become more content. So reflection, resilience, resourcefulness supports non-worrying, non-frustrated, non-suffering. When you are non-worrying, non-frustrated, non-suffering, you can only be happy. And that is the magical blessing that Vani and I have. We have no money. We still struggle for work to come by. We're dealing with myriad issues, myriad issues. A bankruptcy is a full-time job, people. You have to deal with legal issues. You have to deal with emotional complications. You have to deal with humiliation, insult, injury. You have to deal with parenting issues when you cannot, as a parent, provide for your child, both financially and emotionally, it can be traumatic. And dealing with all of this has been possible because of me time. So I took the time today to share with you this journey because I want you to know that you can be in a situation which appears to be hopeless. You can be in a situation where you're clueless about solving your life's problem. But the more you invest in time on yourself, pause and reflect, the more capable you will be to deal with life's challenges. And when you are more capable, you become happy, no matter what the circumstances are. Hafiz, a poet from the 14th century, I'm suddenly thinking of Hafiz, he said, the rose's beauty is very dear. The rose's beauty is very dear because its petals are there only for a short time he says they come and they're gone too soon such is life the rose's beauty is very dear life's beauty is very dear and it will be gone very soon and if you are not going to invest time in yourself now you may not have time left in the future that's where i want to take us into the second segment. If you have any questions on this segment, put them on menti.com. Uh, 214951 is your passport and money will keep looking and 
curating your questions to pick up the top three or five. Meanwhile, we've got the second segment today, which is a conversation with the our wonderful guest for the evening, which is um, Nandini Nair. Nandini, I will be introducing her, and then I will be uh, inviting her to join me here. Nandini was not known to us at all. We heard of Nandini through a common friend. We got an invitation to her show, but we could not go to her show. And that's how when the invitation arrived on WhatsApp, we heard of this IRS officer Nandini, and then we saw her work, which was part of the WhatsApp message. And I'm going to show you some of the pictures up here for you to see uh, the kind of work that she does. And <coughs> this show was held at Amethyst uh, in June this year at the Folly. And what I found about Nandini's work is that it makes you pause, it draws you into itself, it talks to your inner being, and it says, hey, listen, I have a message for you in case you want to pick it up. So she's that kind of an artist who deeply feels about what she's experiencing, and she expresses that experience in the form of her work. We met Nandini for a, for a coffee a few weeks ago, and we said, let's go and talk to her and find out what makes her do what she's doing. Because we were beginning to curate this new series, and we wanted to have someone who represented both worlds, someone who is professionally very, very occupied, got lots of stuff to do, and somebody who's able to invest herself in what she loves doing. So we were looking for that combination and we uh, went up to Nandini. We found that she leads a very exciting life, even now she was telling me a little while ago about the kind of uh, a case that she is currently pursuing, which many of you must have read in the papers, I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, something that's making the headlines is what she's looking at as an income tax officer. She is in the investigation side of the business. She is uh, doing searches and she's also hosting shows. In the time that we met her till now, she's done this art show and she's also uh, a fabulous dancer. So she's done a, a Mohini art of performance a few weeks ago at the Museum Theatre. So the big question for Rani and me when we met her was how does Nandini Nair, the young, happening IRS officer, pull off this balancing act between the challenges of a professional career and the love of her own art. How does she pull it off? That's the exploration that we're going to have today in the conversation. And after that, we'll open up the floor for you to keep sending us questions, which we will take up after the conversation. Lovely, please join me. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, uh, a little bit too high for you? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's not too high. Okay, so, but you're okay. Yeah, it's not So, let's get started. Let me uh, start by asking you, Nandini. Um, so, when we, when we were talking about coffee and uh, over looking you up on the internet, um, going by your journey so far, this last decade has been very exciting for you. Uh, you. You have been expressing yourself as an artist uh, for, for a large part of this decade. And this has also been a decade where academically and professionally, uh, it's been very important for you. So just for everyone to get an idea, uh, Nandini in this last decade has completed her undergraduation, has completed two master's degrees, has joined the IRS, has gone through training, and has gone through some very professionally challenging, exciting stints already in the services. So how did you stay connected with art? Or what about art kept inspiring you that you didn't lose touch? Because typically, I was, and I think many people can relate to it, I gave up writing when I started a mainstream career in a different space. So you, you lose touch. But how come you have stayed engaged? What, what is it that, that makes it happen for you? 
it was not a conscious decision to you know keep it going. Um, art was never a hobby for me. Uh, like, uh, it was definitely a hobby, but I uh, taken art very seriously from a very young age. Um, I remember like maybe from nine ten years old, I'd uh, you know paint on a daily basis. I'd go for like all sorts of competitions happening in the city. So I could put it. Uh, so all Saturdays, Sundays, my bag would be ready to go for like you know some competition or the other happening in the city. So uh, not just art, I used to like theatre at the school. So my school used to start at you know eight in the morning. So I'd be like you know ready by my school bus would arrive by say seven fifteen or something. So by seven fifteen I'd be all set to go to school. I'll go to school, do whatever that's supposed to be doing, you know, we're supposed to be doing in the school. And then on the way back, I get down at this place where all our you know theatre play rehearsals used to go on. So we used to do that, you know, eat some snacks and practice till some, some 8 30, 9 o'clock, and then come back home, do my homework after that. So I used to be like a busy child, uh, even uh, when I was young. Uh, I think it just continued uh, after that. Uh, it is true that I have uh, finished my undergrad, my postgrad. I did not do like do post graduation, you know, uh, at the go. After my uh, IRS, I joined the services. It was done as part of my training. So I did a master's in economics as well as uh, in business and law. Uh, and in 2012, after finishing my post graduation, I gave my uh, civil services exam. So people, uh, you know, assume that civil services exam is one of the toughest in the country. Uh, people say that you, know, you have to devote a lot of time. Uh, I have uh, listened to my seniors advising uh, youngsters that you should be studying for like at least 12 to 16 hours a day wow. and then give the exam. But uh, I think uh, what I did was I, I don't think I studied for like you know even six hours a day. So I was doing a lot of theatre then. I would go for my dance classes. I even edited a souvenir for my dance school during that time. And uh, so my my life wasn't boring uh, you know, even at that point of time. So uh, after joining services, um, I, I I wouldn't say that you know it continued uh, at the same pace. There was a lull because I uh, I was in training for about sixteen months. Uh, uh, at the academy uh, and then when I joined back in the field it was all new for me and I was like 25 years old and very young in the field and I didn't know how to handle a lot of things. People wouldn't take me seriously. The first place I'm like uh, you know I look, I look very young and I'm a girl and so uh, it was a difficult phase so uh, I don't think I pursued art very seriously at that point of time. But it's been a part of your journey. Yeah. You, you, you somehow kept it there. Yeah, but right. uh, it was uh, it was very much like essential to my you know existence. It was it, it had to be there. So if I wasn't doing art, I would feel you know okay, I'm lacking something in my life, or there was some sort of uh, you know a lagging uh, feeling that okay, I should be doing this. And so the, therefore, you went back and kept uh, yeah, yeah. kept investing yourself. Yes, in yes, yes. This is a very important point. You are trying multiple things as you're growing up and a couple of things become an integral part of your life and then you go into the earning a living bubble and then you think that those couple of things that were giving you a lot of joy can wait. This is where we all make that mistake. And this is what she's saying that she recognized that it was an integral part of who she is and she decided to go back and keep investing in it. So the, the key takeaway is you have to invest in it for it to stay with you, for you to feel that it is continuing to be an important part of your life. You have to invest in it. And here investment is not an investment of money alone. It's, don't think of investment as only financial. It is an investment of your soul, an investment of your time, which is why we're talking about me time. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the process you follow. For example, if you take uh, your recent show, or the one that we couldn't be at, but the one that we loved so much. So this show, Small Talk, had 50 uh, works of yours, including an installation, and um, 50 works is a lot. So I want to ask you, as an artist, did you decide that you're going to have a show called Small Talk, and then you built up your work for it? Or did the work get created and then you said, let me do the show? What was the process involved in, uh, on the one side, running your professional life and on the other side, actually working towards the show? Um, a lot of 
people ask me, uh, what is the process? Like, you know, what is, what is the process of an artist? How do, how do these works come into existence? How do they go? Um, I don't know. But uh, the show was not a, a decision like, okay, I have to do this show, so I have to make works for it. It did not uh, come up like that. Um, I was I was working on a few things. I think the earlier slide which you showed, uh, there was one work, uh, you know, on the left side. So I was going through a difficult phase. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know. I was not happy. I had a lot of conclusions, and um, basically, I was thinking, there's a storm inside my head. There's a storm inside. Storm inside my head. So I didn't want to, you know, yell at anybody or I mean, something personal. So I didn't want to, you know, have a, uh, a dispute with anybody. So I basically painted at that point of time. So I titled that work as, you know, there's a storm inside my head. Oh, you called it the storm. Yeah, yeah. It's titled there's a storm inside my head. Okay. Uh, so I mean, there's a process behind, uh, you know, every work. Sometimes it's spontaneous. Sometimes it's just like something that you would, like plan for a long time. So I was creating works. I was painting. Uh, some of these works were very intimate. It was very me. Uh, a lot of them had. I mean, if you notice, a lot of them had like women uh, holding the center stage. It was mostly about women. I love painting women and. That's because I relate to them. Um, you know, I, I I grew up in a very liberal sort of a family setting, so we wouldn't uh, differentiate between men and women and things like that. Um, so, but the world was not like that. As I grew up, I realized that you know society is essentially patriarchal, and there are a lot of things that you wouldn't agree with, um, and that uh, made me realize that you know you need to realize the identity of uh, women. So most of the works that I started uh, working on, they were my reactions to how the society perceived <coughs> women, uh, what my thoughts were. Sometimes some of them were very emotional reactions. Some of them were like escapes, rescuers. So it was uh, it was a mix of you know all of these emotions. Some of them I deeply like relate to them. I mean now when I talk about it, it's easy, but some of them, some of those times were not easy. Uh, you know I used to wonder. Like, I've not gone through any big crisis in my life and that used to bother me a lot. Like, I need to go through something in my life to be like a good artist and, you know, to have that uh, rich experience. <coughs> Sometimes that used to bother me. So, and um, you still express it. Yeah, I still express it. But, you know, you cannot really uh, quantify, like, you know, the magnitude of your worry, right? right? You know, even a smaller thing or a bigger worry. It's, it's about how you look at it. How many, how many months did it take for 50 works to get done? So I started the painting one by one and all of them had a constant you know, theme running along over there. So uh, about 50 works were done in a period of like one and a half years. Um, and then some of them added to it, like some of them need to be, needed to be like thematic and you know. So I created them along with it. The uh, installation is titled Plunge. Basically, you're neither there, you're not there, you're not here. Uh, you know, that so you space. Must make this, you must make this. Yeah, job. whether you need to make that call, whether to plunge, plunge or, not. or not. So it, it is that space. Amazing. I'm picking up a uh, few learnings here. Uh, please go back to what she said. She said that uh, many people ask me what is the process you follow, and I don't know. I don't know how it happens. Uh, we were listening to Ilay Raja the other day uh, at the IIT class. And he said, 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 I will lack the curiosity. So, he he's, he's delighted with the fact that he still does not know where his music is coming from. So, it's like that. And I think the second point I'm picking up is that, um, uh, what was the, what was the painting, the name of the painting? The Storm Inside. Storm inside. The Storm Inside. So, when you, when you are going through a, a challenging phase, what would be the challenge? When you're going through a challenging phase, please try this. Take time out for yourself. Go do what you love doing. You will heal in that short term. You will heal. Now you can make this continuous. And there is a little reflective process required there. You have to understand the nature of life. Life has two states. One is existing and the other is the living state. In the existing state, we are all past masters at existing. We've all done that, okay? In the existing state, 
you are earning a living you are trying hard to become something and you are constantly besieged by worry grief anger negativity all that scarcity think in the living state that's a very organic and a dynamic state your first state is being now if you are here in this conversation with, with me and nandini you are there is a being of you here the second state is an immersive state second step in that state is immersive where you go and immerse yourself in reading a book you can go immerse yourself in doing a piece of art you can do an immersive experience with a dance with music there's a third state which is the state of being dissolved where you become that you the dancer becomes the dance the artist becomes the painter you the writer becomes the word the speaker becomes the word you dissolve we all experience this illusion dissolving state we all experience this we have experienced this in devotion bhakti prayer surrender in art music in sex in dance in painting so the key is how do you sustain it and that is where me time helps so i'm bringing it back there that what you give what gives you complete solace helps you take away from the challenges of earning a living if you invest in that you will be able to in a way do what she has been able to do though she didn't do it as a process setting out saying i'm going to do a show but it organically grew around you right not yes. so that we are right yeah, way yeah. to say yeah. so this is this is fascinating and all of you should look at nandini's story from that point of view not just as oh wow she's done a show but i can't you can because if nandini can you can <laughs> let me go to my next question if you take theater and you don't do so much of theater now particularly because you 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 were away from kochi and yeah. uh, you were also uh, in your in your uh, work it's very demanding but theater <coughs> dance and painting all three are your expressions <coughs> right now my question is what would they do to you in a manner in which uh, you feel that it helps you uh, deal with your professional stresses is it is it is it at all in any manner uh, providing you a, a daily de stress uh, just doing a painting or doing a riyaz a practice session for your dance do these things really help you yeah definitely i mean i cannot imagine my life without any of these things uh, happening uh, theater from a very young age uh, i mean i used to do uh, i used to do children's theater uh, plays with kids and then uh, when i grew up i done like other theater um you yeah, so i grew up in this urban kitchen setting and city schools and all that um children theater when we got together to do plays i would have made like the best of my friends from theater even now we are still in touch and they came for my exhibition and they are always there for me um, so uh, you know theater has given me a lot of exposure to the life <coughs> that is happening around so uh, uh, back in kochi when we were doing plays the, uh, the the name of the theater group was rogadani so there we had a mix of you know crowd like a lot of people coming from different strata of life um, in fact one of uh, the seniors he he was this amazing person we have a lot of respect uh, towards him he uh, basically earned his living uh, through loading and unloading jobs like he was a head load worker so that is what he did for a living at his free time he would do theater he would uh, sing songs spoke uh, songs and he would teach us such an amazing person that i would never come across anybody like that if not for theater so theater gave me a lot of exposure lot of uh, you know uh, an interactive space where i could interact with a lot of people from different parts of the society parts of the state um and made a lot of friends but it is it is different when it comes to dance dance the, the practice in itself uh, i mean i used to learn bharatanatyam when i was in kochi recently i started learning more oh, okay. 
get together, you have your fellow dancers, you practice together, you, you use your body and mind and the rhythm, it, it needs a lot of concentration and things like that. But uh, art is completely different from this. It, it is a personal experience, there's a lot of me in it. I can do it at any time I want to. I'm stressed, I can do it. Uh, I'm happy, I can do it. I'm sad, I can do it. So uh, each has you know, its own purpose. Um, that's how it has been and de-stressing, I told you, I think I told you already this, I would have gone mad without, you know, any of these things happening because life is stressful <coughs> as an IRS officer. It's not easy. Life is stressful, period. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not just as an IRS officer. I think people representing different different backgrounds yeah. are here and they all agree with you. Yeah. So, as an IRS officer, uh, why is stressful? Because uh, I can't uh, tell you the details. But I'm telling you, it's very stressful. Uh, see, I'm, I'm in investigation right now. Uh, one of our senior officers who retired uh, from IRS is also here. So, uh, he would agree with me on this. It, it, it is very hectic, it is uh, stressful. In fact, one of my colleagues, once uh, I had this show and I'm having this dance performance. So, one of my colleagues asked me once, uh, you must be really free, you know, you're doing all these things. And I, I tell this person, I am not free, I am really struggling, I have a lot of work. I am not free, but I am still doing this. Once, I am not a regular on social media, I am not on Facebook or anything, but recently, it's been just one year, I joined Instagram, I put up my paintings uh, once in a while. So after a couple of them uh, went online, I got a message from one random person, I think he studied along with me in school. Uh, he messaged me, uh, you know, we are paying you out of taxpayers' money. You are a civil servant. Basically, you are supposed to do your job and not do like all these paintings and upload it on social media. So I was like shocked, uh, you know, because uh, I, I told him that I, I in fact uh, put up a clarification online on my story that see, listen, I am working really hard. I am doing my work, but uh, you know, I am doing. I am actually finding my me time. Fantastic. <laughs> That's a very valid point you make. That's going to trigger my next question, but just hold on a second. I think the big learning here is that if you, if you look at, does it, does it de-stress her? Does it uh, provide her an opportunity to bounce back into being who she really is? And her answer is that I would have gone mad without this. Because life is stressful. Arivan Shrai Bachchan, Amitabh Bachchan's father, a great poet, has said, Jeevan ka matlab hai sangharsh. Life means challenge. Every every step of the way, you will have to deal with it. It doesn't mean that life is only about challenges, but you cannot have a life free of challenges. You will have to encounter them. And what she said is very true. You end up uh, dealing with it better when you are you are practicing me time. That's what I'm picking up. But now I go to the that unwitting a uh, friend of yours or a uh, classmate of yours who unwittingly asked this, um, uh, you know, rather uh, unique question. Uh, are you using taxpayers' money to, to, to pursue your, your, your joy, what you like to do? Uh, I have a different take on that. Has your me time, hasn't your me time made you a better professional uh, as, a, uh, as an officer working in the services today? Do you, do you feel that? Um, definitely, yes. Um, without this, I don't think uh, I would have been an efficient officer. Like neither this nor that. It would be that sort of a situation. Um, in fact, uh, in my first year of posting, I was posted at this uh, remote-based uh, in Tirnaveli. I was holding uh, the charge of Tirnaveli district as well as Vedagumari district. So I would uh, uh, travel to my office at Nagatol every uh, once in every week. Um, so it will take about two hours for me to reach there and I have to see all the files and finish all the work and then come back uh, to the very where I was residing. Um, that would take another two hours. So I had very little time, maybe like six or seven hours in the office and all the work for one, one week, one or two weeks would be like piled up and uh, I had very little time to you know go through the files. But I, I used to effectively plan things and you know I, I always felt that my productivity while at office, you know, in the Nagarpur office was much better than how I used to work back in the day. So I believe in Parkinson's law. Basically your report <coughs> expands according to the time that you have. So when you have less time, you plan better and then you, you know, you do better. You, uh, I mean, you don't have to really work for long, long hours. Uh, That's a stereotype.
stereotype. Isn't that's it? such a that's such a stereotype. I mean, I want to break a lot of stereotypes. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was young, I used to do like some shows on television and all that. I used to host reality shows on TV. I mean, I've done that. So uh, a lot of times I felt that you know people look, look at you differently. Like when you're when you're a young girl and you're like wearing some nice clothes and some makeup, you're supposed to just look pretty and you know uh, just basically recite your words, whatever that is taught to you. And that is it. You don't they don't expect anything more from you. But uh, we are also individuals, and uh, uh, all those works in small talk probably uh, you know resulted like uh, from these. Uh, kind of thoughts like okay, uh, I have an identity uh, other than being just like a pretty face or like a blue girl. Um, in or fact, being a, or being a government being officer. a government officer. So, um, as a government officer, you're expected to behave in a certain manner and expected to do certain things. It needn't be, it needn't be always be. And we have our private lives and we enjoy our lives and we don't have to be like grumpy. And you, <laughs> you give us a lot of hope. We are all beginning to feel very disillusioned with the new India that's being painted in front of us. In between all of that, we, it's, it's delightful to see uh, the new face of our, of our bureaucracy, if I may, uh, which is an artistic face, which is a happy face, which is, which is not the Babu face. Uh, but that's a stereotype that you are breaking, so thank you so much for that. But the, but, but, but the point I'm also picking up from you, which is very relevant for all of us, is uh, why do we need more than eight hours <coughs> to be invested at quote unquote work? There was a science with which an eight hour working day was, was defined. Why do we go beyond the eight hour working day? Why do we uh, work on weekends? Why do we take work home? The simplest answer to all of this is because we are not planned and we expand our working hours to, uh, you know, thanks to a lot of distractions that we indulge in. And many a time we don't know how to say no. So you get sucked into un unwanted meetings. This happens in the corporate landscape all the time. I'm sure it happens in governments too. Unwanted meetings you get sucked into situations where you're pressed into service, unless there's an emergency, you're pressed into dealing with somebody else's crisis. Unless there's a national emergency or there's a customer emergency, you get pressed into a situation where somebody else has made a mess and you have to bail, bail the organization out. So many of the times we don't know how to say no. And this is what we've seen uh, in our life and we have seen this uh, systematically happen around organizations and around workforces. So it's very important to understand what she's saying. I met a gentleman who uh, is from Kerala again, uh, James Joseph is his name, and uh, he is uh, uh, he was working for Microsoft, and uh, he told me that in his organization he had a very simple process with his boss that this is my working time and. Beyond this time, if you need my time, uh, unless it's an emergency, I need to be uh, pre-warned about it. Uh, there is, please don't come to me with any requests because I have other things to do. And Google him, very interesting life he leads. And, and um, he's even written a book called God's uh, Own Office, uh, where he talks about um, you know, living on top of a coconut tree and uh, plucking coconuts while doing a conference call. So uh, he calls it God's own office. So if you set boundaries, so what can you learn from Nandini? What can you learn from James Joseph? What, what can you learn from people who manage to do this balancing act? It's very simple. You can learn how to prioritize what matters most to you, why does it matter to you, and how can you keep that in focus? If you do that, then I think a lot of it falls But when you say this, uh, it sounds like I'm a very systematic person, that's not true. <laughs> no, you don't need to be systematic. But if you have your priorities right, yeah, yeah. No, I think it, it can also be that you, uh, you do goof off and you do yeah. uh, get dragged into unwanted meetings. But you still manage to pull off a, a show, a performance. Yeah. Uh, you still are, are, are the living embodiment of... Uh, of, of a cheerful bureaucrat, yeah. so thank you. <laughs> so there is 
uh, there is a great merit in what you are doing, yeah. even if you are doing it with No, I am feeling guilty. Oh my god, I am not as systematic as you know. No, as I am making you out to be. Okay. Uh, one, one more question uh, here, uh, which is really about <coughs> when you when you are in college, when you are coming out of college, you come with a with, with, with certain set of expectations of how life has to be. And for you, it's been a very interesting phase where on the one side art has led you, on the other side uh, your work has led you, and you've done well with both. What has this taught you about life? And uh, has, it, has it changed the way you look at life? Uh, and what has it taught you about happiness? And uh, has it reiterated anything for you? How do you see it? Very difficult to answer, I think. Um, um, when I was a little girl, uh, we had one of those uh, writing sessions when we had to write uh, about something, like they give you a topic to write about. So, um, a lot of people, uh, I mean, basically you had to write about what you want to become, what, what is your ambition, what you want to become in life. So, everybody started, uh, like my parents were, all of our parents were also there. It was some sort of a uh, school, uh, inter school meet or something. Um, so everybody wrote about different ambitions and it was read out. Uh, this my parents told me, I don't remember this, but my parents told me. Um, so everybody was, uh, you know, either you know, they wanted to be a doctor or an engineer. So uh, I, I did not read out and uh, towards the end someone asked uh, uh, a question like, any of you, have you written anything different, you know, other than these things? So I think it seems I raised my hand and I was asked to come and read what I did. So uh, my dad was present in the audience. So my dad thought that okay, I say something like I want to be an IS officer, or you know, something along that line. Uh, but what I'd written was uh, I'd written a you know lengthy uh, prose, like I'd written something long uh, about how I wanted to fly and I wanted to be a bird. Wow. Yeah. So that is you know the little me. So uh, so I think that's there in me, and I can't like separate. So that side of you who wants to fly or who just wants to like, just see the world. <laughs> so, and that's your idea of life and happiness. Yeah, so I think it's that. always there. So even if I'm like a bureaucrat and I'm doing this taxation thing and all that, I just want to do that. I mean, I can't separate that uh, that that me from you know this person that I am. Sounds like Vidya <laughs> <laughs>
no matter who I am on this side. And I think that's the big takeaway for us this evening. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. So please stay on as we take some questions. Um, do we have questions, Mom? We have one question. Uh, so, I'm by the way, before we before you proceed, let me put up that. Uh, uh, if those of those of you who came late uh, and want to ask a question, please type on your browser on your phone uh, www.menti.com. And today's passcode is two one four nine five one. Please type two one four nine five one and put your name and your question and send it, and Vani will uh, pull it out. Yes. So this question is from Vinod. Uh, he says, what is your take on love what you do? Uh, will you still do what you don't love at times? Um, as that would, would be your bread and butter. I believe me time helps. Am I right? So what? Actually, uh, no, I'll ask the question. I, I don't want us to break this process. There is a reason why we are doing this via Menti because we find that people are not very articulate when it comes to asking a question and it goes all over the place so we want to stay with that. I think the question is sharply, will you still do uh, what you don't love to do because uh, in, in a professional work setting you may have to do it. In those cases does me time help you? Uh, yeah, I mean you know? it's inevitable. I mean you're in bureaucracy, you're, you have to do things that you don't love, uh, certain things that you don't agree um, it's inevitable, you can't uh, live without that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to make it work. <laughs> You're trying to make it work. Yeah. That's an But I think, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it helps me, like, uh, you know, having uh, something like art or dance, going back to it. Uh, there is some sort of an excitement all the time, okay, something is coming up. Like, I have to get through this because I have to, you know, I have some dance performance coming up or something coming up, uh, uh, you know, or some art show coming up. So interesting. So can can I add a question there? Is there as much excitement as you have in in art in a search when you when you're going as an income tax officer and conducting a, a search of a devices and or going through documents looking for a clue for tax evasion? Is it, the excitement um, the same? It is not uh, just looking at documents. Um, search is a very exciting process. Um, it might appear like you know monotonous and uh, boring uh, from outside, but uh, certain times, uh, you know, I have uh, looked at lives. I mean, you just like go into somebody's personal space. Uh, basically, we are intruders. We are not welcome. Nobody wants us there. But uh, you know, you come across a lot of people. Their real nature. I have uh, I have gone through a lot of emotions. You know, looking at their lives. In fact, some of my uh, friends who make movies, I tell them there are a lot of stories, you know, that I, I should tell you, like, uh, without revealing the identity of people. Maybe this, this makes, like, you know, good plot for uh, movies because it's very exciting. It's not that boring. And um, I get some sort of academic satisfaction. It's not that, uh, you know, this is very boring work, academic stuff. Uh, it's interesting, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes it could be bad. Interesting. Uh, there's a question for Nandini. Career is your identity. Would you like to be known as an IRS officer or a Mohini Atom dancer? I don't know. <laughs> um, if I meet somebody like uh, in the airport or something, I try not telling who I am. Like, I'll try to say something else. And uh, I'll try to not tell them who I am. I wouldn't want to associate myself as an officer or like, a dancer or something. Yeah, but uh, if, you, if you check my Insta feed, uh, you'll see art, artist. So I would like to be known as an known artist. As an artist. artist. Known as an artist. <laughs> I think you may also like, um, if I may suggest, uh, uh, I'm a bird and I want to fly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something, like <laughs> Something like that. Here's one more question. Um, again, this is from Vinod. Uh, major part of your time is spent in office. So should you be doing what we love doing. Since we are in, I think the question is, since we have a lot in in the office, how do we end up doing what we love doing? I think so, that's the question. Yeah, I think we, we spent a little time on the process, but 
can you really talk about let's say you you're having a show coming up or you're having a dance program coming up how do you manage your time better i think that's the uh, that will help uh, clarify this question so. um uh, actually i don't know i don't know how i manage i am not a very systematic person i am not the person who gets up early in the morning and you know does my work i mean uh, uh, I, i don't get up in the morning then exercise for this much time and then go back to breakfast and then work i am not a person like that i have never had any time tables even uh, when i was appearing for my civil services exam i just like went with the flow um i somehow managed always um when i'm at office i kind of uh, i'm dedicated i i come i give my 100% to my work um but when i require time i decide that okay this this time i need and i take some time off so That's when you do have have the requirement of that time you your your i am not hesitant to you know maybe ask for my time i i i, I don't think that i have to be at office from 9 o'clock to 9:30 or 10 o'clock in the night i have done that i have worked on saturday sundays i have had long working hours but i don't i don't see that as a norm like you don't have to do that all the time it is you know it is your right to have your own time and i don't uh, think that i should deny that <coughs> very well said very well said i uh, i'll come i'll come to you in a moment but i want to add that i i have a very uh, different process compared to uh, nandini's i'm i'm personally very time table driven uh, it has yeah. to be done in a certain way but what life has taught me is that sometimes life will take the timetable and turn it on its head and it will get plucked out of your hand in which case i will sit back at the end of the day and reflect in my mauna session or early in the morning when i wake up and do my mauna at my desk uh, how can i reclaim what has been taken off out of my hand uh, so i don't get keyed up about that anymore and i don't let that postpone what needs to be done so earlier there used to be a complaining thought that i will let it go for uh, you know uh, for this reason but now i don't let it yes uh, the next question is actually interesting how can one make work itself so joyful and artistic is it too much to ask for or do you really think it's doable basically should we look for art outside of work or can we make work itself art and joyful that's it's the question it's very personal i mean it depends on it depends on what you're doing and uh, i like some diversity in my life like if i'm doing art all the time i'm a full time artist i might get bored of it so i need some sort of it is almost like as a as a little girl you're writing exams you know that once the exam is over you know you have some free time and then then you enjoy your free time but if you don't have exams you are like completely free you don't enjoy it as much as you would so there's something you know th there should be some sort of a diversity i mean it's not like you're you're going to be like enjoying your work all the time even if it is boring a time will come when it is not boring so yeah <laughs> if you if you if you're stuck in work which is uh, very 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 uh, torturous for you then you're in the wrong place clearly so uh, don't be in a state of denial snap out of it but if you're stuck in a place where you find that uh, in a particular phase at work it's torturous then embrace me time step back do what you love doing take a break Re revive recharge yourself and that i have always found it extremely powerful so when i feel very very trained i have got many times to one year even now i tell her something not okay something's disturbing me you know dealing with the bankruptcy you don't know which influence is pinning you down there are so many people uh, trying to get at you from different directions it can become very very uh, suffocating and then i will say let me do one thing let me sit and write down so i will take my post it pad and i will write what i am feeling i will write you know this is how i am feeling at this moment and the next morning i I'll write a blog post on my feeling, on what I'm learning, and I'll heal through that experience. So, me time really helps. And then there's the third situation. So, in the first situation, you're in the wrong place. In the second situation, you can do me time. The third situation is the most appropriate situation, where you, if you, if it is within you, be in the space that you love being. 
do the work that you love doing. And for knowing more about it, you need to come to a program called Miss Catchers, which is also a show that we run uh, at the ODC Bookstore. More about that later. You have the next question? That's it. Okay. So I have one, one, one more question for you. Um, <coughs> have you ever thought of your, your, your time right now when um, you are in the services about five, six years, seven years since you joined the <coughs> services? But as you grow progress in life, family, growth in career, uh, does it really uh, mean anything to you at this time? That maybe you may not be doing some of your art in the future. Does that thought occur? Does that worry you? Does that bring you down? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, in fact, I've not thought about it. So, um, I'm not worried about it. But I think I'll be doing it, whatever happens. I, I'll still be doing art, definitely. I think I'd, do, I'd be doing all of this. <coughs> so far it has not changed, so why should it change in the future? That's a fantastic. That I ask this hypothetical question because uh, sometimes uh, people do look at you and ask you this question. And uh, some people get a little intimidated by that, by that question because uh, it is a reality that can happen. But if you go by the basic premise of Nandini's philosophy, which is, I am a bird and I want to fly then the context does not matter. So it can be IRS, it can be a family, a children, it can be uh, you know in a different role, uh, but it can be this form of art or another form of art, but that philosophy is, is what is guiding you. Would that be right? Yes. Yeah. So that's what made you give this. Uh, yeah, this uh, conversation has been very introspective because I'm thinking about all of these things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm going to take you through some uh, broad learnings here, which may be useful, and we are on track as far as time is concerned. Uh, do we have any more questions? No. So uh, I'll take you through this, uh, make a few announcements, and close the uh, evening as, as planned. Uh, so please bear with me as I do this. See, one of the most uh, important things about life is you don't get a second chance at doing anything. You can live only once. This moment is gone. So we have to recognize that we have a responsibility towards ourselves first. And many of us try to put someone else above us. It can be a parent, it can be a spouse, it can be a child, it can be uh, an organization, a boss, a target, a goal, and we deprioritize ourselves. We like to be martyrs. We like to be sacrificial lambs. And there's a great consolation in saying to other people, But at the end of the day, if you are unhappy doing it, why are you doing it? This is the big question. And this is where somebody like Nandini, very young but extreme clarity, helps us see things from a different way. Which is that you live only once, so might as well live this life very, very, very meaningfully, very powerful. I'll tell you, uh, way back in uh, when I was starting my career, I had a job which I had got in order for me and Bani to get together. And that job was paying me at that time, <coughs> in 1988, 1,500 rupees. And I got a job with the New Indian Express, now called the New Indian Express, at the time it was called the Indian Express, to be a journalist. And that job was going to pay me 700 rupees. So there was 1500 rupees, there was 700 rupees, and there was the opportunity to start a family with money. And we were precisely at that crossroads in life. And I remember asking Vani what to do. And she said, what will make you happy? <coughs> that was my first encounter with the idea of happiness. Nobody had asked me that question until that time. I was 19 when that question was asked of me by Vani. 
what will make you happy? And I said, writing. And she said, then there is no need to think. We will make do with what, what we earn. 700 rupees or 700 rupees. Now, it was a 50% cut that we were going to take. But we leaned on the side of happiness. I didn't know at that time I'd be sitting in front of you and telling the story and that in our new avatar, having blown up 5 crore rupees in a business that sunk, uh, we will now become be the happiness balas and I'll be talking about happiness to people. But that was the very first instance of understanding what matters to you and why. And that, I will always be grateful to Vani for that. She is the true happiness one because she taught me what it was back then, although I might not have had the space to understand it. I have learned over time that intelligent living, you know like intelligent living, you've all heard of intelligent living as a concept? Intelligent living is not about bringing your intelligence to living. Intelligent living is to live intelligently. Look at the reality, look at the perishable nature of your life and understand that before you know, it will be gone. Understand that. And so intelligent living really means to celebrate that impermanence. And the only way you can celebrate that impermanence is by making today count. Making this moment, this shana count. The power of now, as they say. And you can make it count by doing what you love doing. And a good start is by investing one hour every day on yourself. You can see. For me, we worked with Mauna in three stages, stilling the mind, deploying the stillness, immersion, and now I understand what dissolving means. What does it mean to completely dissolve in what you love doing? So for me, it worked like that. But the big story is not about what I did. The big story is about what you have the potential to do. If you invest one hour in yourself every day, meantime, you can reclaim the remaining 23 hours in your control. The 23 hours that are currently slipping out of your hand, even before you know it, can come back in your control. So that's my big takeaway. A lady uh, who came with us today to share her journey has told us pretty much the same thing, the stresses of her job, the challenges, of being unsystematic, if I may yeah. you, and yet being able to do all yeah. this. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. I, just, uh, please, I just make a couple of announcements and we'll close for the evening. So, uh, we do have these four uh, uh, conversations that we host, non-commercial, free to the public, and uh, they happen at different places, bliss catchers and happiness conversations happen at ODC at AR. Um, Uncommon Leader happens at uh, Madras Management Association uh, of Mount Road. And Happiness Reboot has been happening here last two times. Um, we did one in October and we did one now. We've been doing it here. Uh, but we told that this venue is closing down. So we're looking for a new home for Happiness Reboot. You will hear about it soon once we find a place. Uh, but until then, we, uh, you know, we are, we are searching for a place. So, if you would like to register, if any of you, I see a lot of new people here. If you would like to register for our conversations, and all our conversations have only one theme, which is happiness. And we take the story back again and again. Whosoever story we are curating, whoever we are in conversation with, we take the story back again and again to the central idea of life, which is being happy. We must understand that we were not made, we were not created, this gift of life was not given to us for us to make two ends meet. That's an economic necessity that mankind has invented. We were created to be happy. And so that's what we explored. So take a picture of this, send a message to this uh, number on WhatsApp, send your uh, name, details, uh, any 
email ID and be added to our WhatsApp list. We will not spam you. You will not receive any forwards and good morning messages. All you will get from us are event invitations for programs that we curate and post. So please um, join the community, help us spread the message of happiness. And uh, please Google us, Vani and me, happiness while us, happiness spelled with a Y. We spell it with a Y because it's a decision you must take, the individual must take. So on that note, with an invitation to all of you to not postpone happiness, let me thank you all for being here. Thanks for making this evening special, Nandini. We really love having you here. Thank you so much. Good evening, people. Thank you.